Praise the Lord. Before we begin to hear from God's word today, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy faithfulness, that as we call unto thee, thou answereth us, showing us great and mighty things that we know not. For thy ways are much higher than our ways. For as high as the heaven is to the earth, so great are thy ways compared to our ways. We delight to do thy will, for we delight ourselves also in thee, and thou givest us unto us our heart's desires. And it is our heart's desire to hear thy word. For as newborn babes we desire the sincere milk of thy word, whereby we may grow thereby, as man shall not labor but alone. But every word which proceedeth out of thy mouth, we thank thee for giving us this day our daily bread. We thank thee for supplying all of our need according to thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank thee for thy faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Once again, before we hear from the preaching of God's word, I'd like to give a few more testimonies, as we always have testimonies to give, as it is written in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it is written, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or also hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Notice it does not say ye cannot serve God for mammon. It says ye cannot serve God and mammon. You have to choose, are you going to serve God or are you going to serve mammon? Is it God who is going to supply all your need according to his riches and glory of Jesus our Lord? Or is it mammon that supplies your need? Who is your master? Who is your God? Is it the Lord or is it mammon? So praise the Lord. The reason why we have to say this for is here in this country, there are many people who serve mammon, who worship mammon, and who mammon or money is the answer to all their problems. So much so, it is a very sad thing to say this, that there's many women who sell themselves to men, especially from the West, in hopes of getting mammon. So much so that we have in English here in Thailand a saying called the sick buffalo story. That is where a woman of this country will write to her Western boyfriend or Western husband, or if a woman marries a Westerner or moves to the West, in which here in this country they the West is very rich and has so much money, they'll write to their relatives or write to the person in the West a sick buffalo story, a sad story to get money from their relatives in the West, or a local woman here who has married a husband in the West will write to her husband or her boyfriend in the West and tell them a sad story of how they need money. Maybe their mother's sick in the hospital. Maybe they said their father's sick in the hospital. Or the buffalo is sick. So it's called the sick buffalo story. We don't have sick buffalo stories. No. In every one of our testimonies, in every one of our sermons, we have good news. We don't have sad stories. We have only good stories. Why is that? Because we do not serve mammon. Those who are trying to get money through the ministry will have the sick buffalo stories about how hard it is, how much money they need. They have needs for this building, needs for that building, needs for this or needs for that. Or very sadly, they'll use orphans to raise up money here. I know of so-called missionaries who don't even have orphanages. But they'll take pictures with young children to send to their supporters as if they are supporting orphans to raise up that money overseas. They're serving mammon. That's why they always have sad stories, stories of being in want, stories of being in need. We serve God. We only have good stories of God supplying our need, our God taking care of us, our God supplying each and every one of our needs. Years ago, I used to preach the Word of God from a pulpit of a church at Nontabri, Thailand, right outside of Bangkok, and they falsely accused us. They falsely accused us of telling our stories to make money. 
We had to counter that false accusation by telling them if we wanted money, we wouldn't be telling good stories of God supplying our needs. We'd be telling sad stories of being in need to raise up money. No, we don't raise up money. We don't tell people our needs. We don't ask people for our needs. Our God supplies all of our need according to, our rich, according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, we have good stories to tell. We have good testimonies to give. We don't have any sad stories. We don't have any woe is me stories. We only have good testimonies to give. And in John chapter 14, verse 14, that is written in the book of John chapter 14, verse 14. Beginning verse 13, the Lord Jesus Christ says, of John chapter 14, verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Praise God, as the Bible says, to train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Ye have been trained up in the faith. The Christian faith. You have been trained up in the promises of God that since you began speaking, we have trained you to memorize scriptures, to memorize the promises of God and how to use them in prayer. For as it is written in Isaiah chapter 55, in the book of Isaiah chapter 55, Verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now how does the word of God return back to the Lord? The Lord says, so, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Where is that word that goeth forth out of his mouth? is right here in the pages of this book, the authorized version of the Holy Bible. As Jesus Christ says in Matthew 4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word is proceeded out of the mouth of God. These words here in this book proceed out of the mouth of God. And it's written in Isaiah 55, verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. How does God's word return back to God? Because the Lord says, It, God's word, shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it, the word of God, shall prosper the thing whereto I sent it. How do we get God's word back to him? Do we send it back to him through the P.O. box? Do you go to the post office and say, For you, God, and put it in a package and mail it away, will I get to God? No. It will not. Do we stand on this roof, the roof of this building? We live in a 22-story building, so it's up on the roof, 22 stories in the air, and we take the Bible, and we try to throw it as far as we can back to God? No, it'll fall back down on our head if we don't watch it. Well, how does God's Word return back to the Lord, and how shall it not return back to the Lord void? By prayer. As it is written, 1 John Chapter 5, verse 14, and verse 15. First John, chapter 5, verse 14, and verse 15. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, in God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us, colon, verse 15. And if we know that He, God, hear us, what so we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Asking according to God's will is asking according to God's Word, for God's Word is God's will. If you want to know the will of God, you've got to know the Word of God. The Word of God is God's will. And how does God's word return back to him? And it shall not return back to him void? By us praying to the Lord. 
according to his word, according to his will. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if he has anything according to his will, or according to his word, he heareth us. And his word shall not return back to him void. And we know that he hear us, because his word shall not return back to void. What so are we us? We know that we have the petitions we desired of him, because we ask according to his will, we ask according to his word. And in John chapter 14, verse 14, as you have been trained, Jesus Christ says, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. What Christ did yesterday, we read about here in the Gospels, He will do today. And what Christ continues to do today, He will continue to do forever. For Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise the Lord. This past Wednesday night, as the Lord ordered our steps and sent us forth to a road here in Bangkok, Thailand, a small little road that separates Sukhumvit Soy 3 slash 1 with Sukhumvit Soy 5, that little road in between is a private road, and they officially called the road, as you see in the street side many times, the Middle East Street. Praise the Lord. Now it's been nicknamed Soy Arab. Soy is a small substreet. But in reality, the official name is Soy Mid or the Middle East Street. And praise God, this past Wednesday evening, as the Lord ordered our steps and sent us forth to the Middle East Street to preach the gospel, being that the Mohammedan month of partial fasting, they don't do full fasting. Now, we fast for 24 hours. We fast from sunset to sunset, nothing but water. But the Mohammedans will fast for one month from sunrise to sunset. We call that a partial fast a.k.a. normal living. <laughs> Sunrise and sunset is not fasting at all. It's only 12 hours in a day, and then they sleep on those days. But praise God, the Mohammedan month of partial fasting, which they call Ramadan, is officially over, and all these souls, men, old men, and young men, have returned back to Bangkok from the Middle East, from North Africa, and from South Asia. Why is it mostly men? Because they believe that after they've done their month of fasting and the good works during that month of going to the mosque and praying up to five times a day if they could, sometimes they don't even do that much. During that month of Ramadan, they're clear now for the rest of the year, and they come to places like this to sin. That's right. This is one of those places they come to, Mohammedans from all over the world, the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia, to sin. And they were there in mass on this past Wednesday evening. And there we were preaching the gospel to them and giving out gospel tracts, praise God, this past Wednesday evening. We are able to give out 424 gospel tracts. And how many Bibles? Eight Bibles? Seven Bibles? How many? You just said you just seven, you said eight. Eight Bibles, okay, praise God. We have a four hundred and twenty-four gospel tracts and eight authorized versions of the Holy Bible this past Wednesday night. But while I was preaching the gospel at the very beginning, they turned on the Mohammedan call to chant. Now they don't pray, they chant. What is chanting? Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Mohammedans, just like Buddhists, just like Hindus, just like Roman Catholics, they pray vain repetitions 
many words, thinking that their God, lowercase g, will hear them for the many words that they speak. We call that chanting vain repetitions. So they put on the loudspeaker in Arabic the Mohammedan call to chant or to pray vain repetitions. And they turned it on so loud this past Wednesday evening that they blew up their speakers. But at the same time as they turned on that call to chant or pray vain repetitions, I had to really lift up my voice louder than ever. You see, those Mohammedans, they're in competition with us. They're trying to beat us. When they give out their war cry of Allah, their false god, Hu Akbar, that means Allah, their lowercase g, God is greater. Greater than who? Greater than the God of the Bible. They're in competition with us. We're just trying to get them saved. We're not competing with anybody, but they're trying to compete with us. And as we're preaching the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God, the salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek, they want to compete with us. So they turned on the Muhammad and called the chant or pray for vain repetitions as loud as they could, so loud they blew up their speakers. But at that time, I had to really preach it. Because if they were to drown out my voice, they would take that as a victory. They would say, see, our God is greater than his God. So I had to really lift up my voice and preach it out. Back when I was a prize fighter, very rarely did I try to go for a first round knockout. Why would you only go for a first round knockout? Very rarely. Because when you're going to try to knock somebody out in the first round, you have a chance of getting knocked out yourself. Because to try to punch somebody, knock them out in the first round, you've got to give it your all. And if you're not careful, you're giving it all, may blow yourself out in the first round, and get you knocked out in a boxing match. Well, this past Wednesday night from the very beginning, I had to give it my all in preaching the gospel. I had to really go for it and completely preach my voice out. The speakers blew out, praise God. We heard the speakers pop and break and blow out. But now that I've outpreached their speakers, I had no more voice left. Kept on preaching. My voice went out. I kept on preaching. As winners never do what? Winners never quit. And quitters never do what? Quitters never win. I kept on preaching. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Better than that phrase is the word of God. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I kept on preaching. My voice was blown out. Had no more voice left. But I kept on preaching. Praise God in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Verse 23. It is written, And being let go, they, the apostles Peter and John, went to their own company, and reported all that the sheep, priests, and others had said unto them, which they threatened them, and commanded them not to preach or teach in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Praise God, we have our own company. Praise God, we serve the Lord together, as it is written, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And as we serve the Lord together as a family, as we serve the Lord together as a house, we are our own company. Praise God for Christians have your own company that know how to pray together with you. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. The Lord Jesus Christ gives to us this promise. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as such in anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And praise God, my voice went out. And my eldest daughter later told me that she prayed. She prayed to God the name of Jesus that the Lord would heal my voice. 
and the Lord Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, who opened the tongue of the deaf, who opened the ears of the deaf, opened the tongues of the dumb, who can make the dumb speak, Jesus Christ healed my voice in answer to your prayer. For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you just into my name, Christ says, I will do it. And Christ can make the dumb to speak. Back in the days of the gospel, Christ can heal our voices when we preach the gospel. And as I continued to preach, my voice was gone. The Lord touched my voice, and it came back louder and stronger than ever. So I could continue to preach the gospel there on the Middle East Street. And all those gospel tracts will be given out, as well as eight copies of the authorized version of the Holy Bible. Praise the Lord. The Lord answers our prayers. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, once again. Verse 24, the Lord Jesus Christ says, No man can serve two masters, for either will hate the one and love the other, you also hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Back in the year 2006, I saw this very clearly. This word for the Lord Jesus Christ, ye cannot serve God and mammon. Back in 2006, the Lord sent me to Minnesota for about 10 days to preach the gospel. And we took a group of young Christians, some Christians out with us in the street to preach in the Twin Cities. And one evening went to Uptown. We've been preaching in downtown. Now we went up to Uptown to preach the gospel in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. Not in downtown this time, but Uptown back in 2006. And as I preached the word of God, preached the gospel street corner, another young brother at the time was serving the Lord full time, was living the gospel at that time, was serving the Lord here with me in Thailand, had gone with me there to Minnesota in 2006. He preached the gospel as well. And the police showed up with one police car. And they grabbed him as he was what they call him, the, the northern Irish call a wee man. <laughs> a small little man. I think it was only about five, six, five, nine. He was a very small little man. They grabbed him, these two women police officers, and threw him in the back of the police car. So, of course, I stood back up and began preaching. As I began preaching, these women tried to do jujitsu on my hands to put me in an arm bar to put me in the police car. I just put my hand out of the way and kept on preaching. Well, then they pulled out the pepper spray and put that in my face. So I said, okay, I'll get in the car voluntarily while I'm preaching. So I started walking to the car. They opened the car door, the pepper spray in my face. I kept on preaching, and then I got to the car. They slammed the door shut. Praise God. The young brother in Christ said to me, I knew you'd be in here. That's why I slid over right away. I knew when they threw me in the police car that you were going to preach, and they are going to put you in the police car. And then that young man's brother-in-law, he began preaching. So scoot over, let's make room for him. But then when the police talked to him, he stopped. And though we had a whole group with us, they all stopped. They all began talking to the police officer, who began threatening them, who began saying, you can't preach, you can't do this here. What happened to them? You see, they were fearful of getting arrested. Why were they fearful of being arrested? They were serving mammon. If they had to go to jail, it's going to cost them money that they're serving for. So they serve mammon. And it could get them fired from their jobs. They were scared as they were not serving God. They were serving mammon and wanted to serve the Lord part time. And now as we made room for them, they get in the police car thinking that if all these men begin preaching one by one, they can't arrest all of us. And if they all get to preach one by one, then they have to call other police men. And then men would show up on the scene, and we could clear this up and keep on preaching away because we knew that men would not stop us from preaching the gospel. These were women having a power trip is all that it was. Because those others stopped preaching. We sat in the police car. Then those women came to the police car, in the police car, empowered by the fact they could stop those other men, and then told us, why can't we be like them and obey them and stop preaching the gospel as all those that came out with us, when the police told them to stop, they all obeyed. Why were they made for? Because they're serving mammon. They're only serving God part-time. 
when it came down to you almost getting arrested, maybe you're going to have to pay a fine, maybe you're going to spend some time in jail, you might lose your job, they stop preaching right away. We let those police women know we're going to keep preaching the gospel. You're not going to stop us. We're going to get out there and preach the gospel. The Bible says, go, you know, that we're preaching the gospel of every creature. The United States of America, which we're in at the time, gave us a First Amendment, the freedom of speech, and even didn't give us freedom of speech, we would still preach the gospel nonetheless. They got mad at us, went back and talked to that group again. That group pleaded with those police women to release us. They begged the police women to release us especially the young man who's preached with me because his earthly father was there and he didn't want him to go to jail. Then they opened the police car door, brought him over. A uh, Judas Iscariot, a turncoat, a traitor, walked over the police women and then they told me that because of him, this young man's earthly father, they will let us go as he had promised them, this young man's earthly father, that we would stop preaching for the night and go home now. I said, woman, when I step my feet out of this police car, I'm going to continue right where I left off. She slammed the door shut, took us to the jail, incarcerated us that night, but praise God, it was a great blessing. We had a great time preaching the gospel in the jail cell. And you know the testimony? They tried to take my mug shot, and it was impossible to do because they can't take your mug shot, the police picture of you, and you're smiling. And when they told me to stop smiling, well, that made me smile even more. So much so they got mad at me, began yelling at me for smiling. Well, that made me laugh now. I've, I'm very ticklish. I laugh very easily, especially since I was born again back in 1995. So when they're yelling at me, stop smiling, I was laughing my head off at them. Finally, I saw these people mean business, so I held my breath, and they took the picture of me, which you guys have seen, which we still have here, of me holding my breath so that I wouldn't be smiling, so I take my mug shot. That's how much joy we had in that jail cell, preaching the gospel. Went to where they locked us down in the communal jail cell, continued preaching the gospel, and a man there trying to commit suicide that night. They sent their canine, their police dog on him, who bit him in the legs. He had a gun in his hand, so he could drop his gun. Then they arrested him, beat him a little bit, arrested him, threw him in jail. And that man repented. As I was preaching the gospel, he was crying and laughing at the same time and said, they didn't need you out there tonight. We needed you in here. I kept on preaching. And he said the most, one of some of the most powerful words I've ever heard since I've been preaching the gospel for the past over 20 years. You have given hope to the hopeless tonight. Praise God. They released us the next day. The next day as we released, all those so-called men who had joined us in preaching but obeyed the police officers, took their threats, obeyed them, stopped preaching the gospel, failed their Lord. What a disgrace. Now, I'm a kind of child that grew up close to my earthly father. My parents were divorced. My father and mother divorced. I was a young age. And you had to choose between your father and mother. Most sissies choose their mothers because their mothers will baby you and say all kind of nice things to you. I chose my earthly father. Praise God. And in order to impress my earthly father, in order to have a relationship with my earthly father, I had to do martial arts. I had to win martial arts trophies. And I won a whole room full of trophies, not a room with trophies, a whole room full of trophies. Why did you win so many trophies for? So I wanted a relationship with my earthly father, and I knew that made him happy. And as I'd win trophies, he'd get happy. That led me to Thailand. There's our box in the square ring here in Thailand and Muay Thai, because it made my earthly father happy, and it gave us a relationship together. Now I'm born again. God is my heavenly father. And I know when I serve him, when I do not fail him, but overcome... He's pleased with me, and that's heaven to me, making my Heavenly Father happy. I knew when I was in that jail preaching the gospel, my Heavenly Father's looking down, smiling upon me. When I was preaching that man who was going to commit suicide, they said to me, you've given hope to the hopeless. I knew my Heavenly Father was happy. I knew I just pleased my Heavenly Father. I left that jail cell as they released us the next day, happy and joyful. Those other men had stayed there the whole night waiting for us, not knowing when they are going to release us. When they saw us, I put my hands in the air, smiling, praising the Lord. And they all put their heads down in shame because they're losers. They failed their Lord. 
They could have been in that jail cell preaching with us. In fact, if they had preached, it would have been a different story that night. But they fell their Lord. They'll put their heads down in shame. And after that, they all broke fellowship with me because they don't serve the Lord. They serve mammon. Mammon is what is important to them and not serving the Lord. They failed their Lord because their service to mammon. As Jesus Christ says, no man can serve two masters for either will hate the one and love the other or else he'll hold the one that's by each other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And they've seen it. These mammon servers, when they try to serve the Lord with us, they last for a short time. When persecution ariseth, when they get to spend some of that mammon, they begin hating us, hating the service of the Lord, and even hating the Lord as well. Because Christ says you either hate the one and love the other, or also hold the one and despise the other. How many professing Christians despise us? Why? Because they serve mammon and we serve the Lord. And they despise us for serving the Lord as they serve that man. And so praise God. In 2006, I saw how clear this is. Ye cannot serve God and mammon, especially in persecution ariseth. And all those people that I talked about, they had nothing more to do with me since 2006. They never invited me back. They, in fact, don't even communicate with me anymore because of... They despise me. They're all serving mammon. Even that young man gave in the temptation and went back and served mammon out and no longer serves the Lord and despises me. Serve the Lord as well as they despise the Lord. They despise the work of the Lord. They despise us who serve the Lord. Because they serve mammon. When you serve God and not mammon, Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, it is written, in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, why does God supply all of our need for? 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 14, once again. 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 14. Over 20 years ago, the Lord called me to preach the gospel. And the Lord showed me he would supply my need as I preached the gospel because it is written, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Why don't we live of the gospel? Because God supplies all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not man, but God supplies all of our need. And this past Wednesday night, had that video clip of us preaching the gospel at East Street. Saw how many souls in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia were on that street. I was excited to put that video online. I was excited to watch that video myself. And on Wednesday nights, we came back from preaching the gospel. Began uploading that video. My computer broke. <laughs> the computer broke on Wednesday night. Couldn't upload that video. Couldn't even watch that video on Wednesday night because the computer broke. Now we use a Mac. Praise God for these Mac computers. They last a long time. They do a good job. You get what you pay for and they're pretty expensive. And so are the spare parts. And when the computer broke, this Mac Apple computer broke, this Macintosh Apple computer, well, the spare part was going to cost quite a lot of money, over 2000 bucks, over 50 U.S. dollars in the Wednesday night. That money could have been two million baht. We didn't have any more money left from preaching the gospel. And now it's going to cost us over 2,000 baht to replace that spare part of the computer. And if we didn't do it, then I wouldn't be able to upload that video. And I wouldn't be able to watch that video myself of preaching the gospel, of coming against that speaker that popped on me, and then my voice being healed, and seeing how many souls are there hearing the preaching the gospel. I was a bit disappointed. But again, Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, Jesus Christ says, Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth, that two of you shall ask, it shall be done for my Father which is in heaven. Praise God, we have our own company. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. On Wednesday night, as we do, we gather together for the sleep and pray in agreement together. And one of the things we pray for is that spare part that we need for the computer. And praise God, the next day, the Lord touched a brother in Christ in Canada to send us a blessing. And wouldn't you know, it was over 2,000 baht, 
over 50 US dollars, or not even 50 US dollars, which is exactly what we needed to buy the spare part for that computer. And the man whom the Lord touched to send us the blessing even had a testimony of why he blessed us. You see, he lost his job a few months ago. He was greatly discouraged. He called me on the phone, called me long distance, discouraged, lost his job. I said, praise God. Now you can serve God. Now you focus on the Lord. Don't look for jobs. Jobs will come. You'll have a job one of these days. Don't focus on that. Focus on the Lord. Now is the time you can spend in God's Word. Now is the time you can spend in prayer. Now is the time you spend growing. You'll have a job later in the Word. God supply your need. Went through the promises of God and God's Word. On God supply all your need according to His riches, glory, Christ Jesus, the Lord. Jesus Christ says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things should be added to you. Went through God's Word with them. Take no thought for the morrow. Live day by day. Just seek the Lord. Grow now. Enjoy this time you have. He testified he couldn't find a job. There was no jobs available. He was seeking the Lord. He was reading his word. And one day, it's a long details. Maybe he can give it one of these days. Maybe he'll come visit us and give it here live. He gave it details that a job came to him. People actually came to him to offer. He didn't go look for a job. They came to his door and asked him for a job, which was much better than the job he had previously. Praise God. But because he took that time off from working to grow in the Lord, now he wants to serve the Lord. Now he wants to serve the Lord full time as he's seen God's grace. But praise God, God did that miracle for him. And then God touched his heart to send the amount he sent to us, which was exactly what we needed to buy the spare part of the computer. So then on Thursday, I could upload that video and take care of that. Praise the Lord. It is a blessing to serve the Lord. You cannot serve God and mammon. And we have good stories because we serve a good God who does good things. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to the Bible's book of Acts chapter 2. Beginning at verse 14 once again. But Peter, why did but Peter send up the eleven, lifted up his voice? Why did Peter send up the eleven? Why did Peter lift up his voice? Because the apostle Peter and the eleven other apostles, excluding Judas Iscariot and including Matthias, and the 120 in the upper room, the disciples of Jesus Christ, had received the promise of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, on the day of Pentecost. And when they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Jews from all over the world, and proselytes, converts to the Jewish religions, strangers of Rome, Cretes and Arabians, from all over the world, gathered at Jerusalem to worship the Lord God in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, when they saw the apostles, when they saw the disciples of Jesus Christ, the 120 from the upper room received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they mocked them and said, These men are drunk with new wine. Verse 13. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. They were falsely accused of being drunkards. They are falsely accused of being wine bibbers. They are falsely accused of being full of new wine. This provoked Peter to stand up. This is the first spirit-filled sermon from one of the apostles of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. He has been stirred up because of their false accusations. He is full of the Holy Ghost. And he lifts up his voice and said unto them, verse 14, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk as ye suppose, it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken of the prophet Joel, verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour it on my spirit upon all flesh. When Christ rose from the dead, these are the last days. What? It's been 2,000 years since Christ rose from the dead. How can you call that the last days? When you compare 6,000 years of man's history, and you go down here to the last 2,000, you're coming to the end. 
The Bible says that one day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. If you take a work week, a six-day work week, the last two days, the work week is what was it called? The weekend. The last two days, the work week. The weekend. T-G-I-F. Thank God it's Friday. Friday and Saturday, they call it the weekend. The last two days of the week, they get excited. The week is over. They're partying on Friday. They're partying on Saturday. They're happy. It's the end of the work week. The last two days of the week. The last 2,000 years of man's history since Christ rose the dead are the last days. When man's history, if you compare it to a week, you're at the last two days. We're at these last two days. We're coming up a time where Christ shall come again. We're in the last days. And God gave to us a promise in the last days. What was his promise in the last days? Verse 17. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. What a day to be living. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After Christ rose from the dead, these last days we're living in, and the last 2,000 years of man's history, before that 1,000-year Sabbath rest, when Christ comes again to rule and reign on the earth, God has promised to pour His Spirit upon all flesh. And we can study church history the past 2,000 years, and you can read about all the revivals that have taken place in church history. And though they may have taken place in different parts of the world and in different denominational churches, they have all one thing in common. What do all revivals have in common for the past 2,000 years? The Holy Spirit. When God pours out His Holy Spirit, no matter where it is in the world, no matter what denomination it is, no matter what peoples it is, when God pours out His Holy Spirit upon people, there is revival, Holy Ghost revival. And you can read about the revivals in church history when God will pour out His Spirit upon different places and different churches. Just like I testified about a few days ago in a sermon I preached when God poured His Spirit there on the Caleb and Hobby Lake Miss and Jewish Congregation in Honolulu, Hawaii. Now the pastor's family became missionaries to Israel. But at that time when God poured His Spirit on that congregation, it was a revival. The building could not hold all the people that came each and every service. And there were more people outside the church building than there were inside the church building. Because God had poured out His Spirit upon that congregation. What a blessing it is to be where God pours out His Spirit. And He has promised us in these last days, verse 17, As shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. God's Spirit is for all. God will give His Spirit unto all. God is no respecter of person, Jew or Gentile. God will pour His Spirit upon all flesh. If that is the case, why is it that not every Christian has the baptism of the ghost? Why is we so see so many in the flesh not have the Spirit of God? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Because Peter preaches unto them at the end of this sermon how to receive the Holy Ghost. And what does he preach and how to receive the Holy Ghost? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent ye, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What does he preach for them to do? Repent. When God poured a spirit of Manchuria, China, to the Manchuria revival of 1908, what preceded that revival? The Christians began repenting. Remember we studied that in detail here? We read the whole history, remember that? We read it chapter by chapter when God poured out the Spirit upon Manchuria, China and the Manchuria Revival of 1908. And if you're watching online, you can find it for free. Do a Google search about the Manchuria Revival of 1908. And you can read about how God poured His Spirit out on all those churches, all those mission stations at Manchuria, China. But what came before that? The Christians began repenting. They began standing up confessing their sins. Hypocrites, missionaries, ordained ministers repenting, talking about how they try to kill their wives, poison their wives, 
talk about how they were lusting after others, repenting of their sins. They began repenting. And when the church began repenting, God poured out His Spirit in every church and every mission organization in Manchuria, China, in the Manchuria Revival of 1908. In 1907, a year prior, God did the same thing in the Korean Peninsula. And it's the same thing happened. The Korean Christians and the missionaries on the Korean Peninsula, they began repenting. They began confessing their sins. They began getting right with God. They had a fear of the Lord. And when they began repenting and confessing their sins and made a break with their sins, God's Spirit was poured on the Korean Peninsula in 1907. So much so that Pyongyang, which is now the capital of North Korea, or the Democratic Republic of Korea, DPKR, the north capital of North Korea, Pyongyang, became known as the Jerusalem of Asia. Because so many church buildings were built. So many Christians were Pyongyang at the time. They had a revival on the Korean Peninsula when the Christians repented and got right with God. Then God poured out His Holy Spirit. And the same thing happened at Cassie Hills. Where's the Cassie Hills? In India. What's the Cassie Hill known as today? Nagaland. They had a revival before back in Nagaland, India, on the Cassie Hills. The same thing happened. The Christians repented. They got right with God and God poured forth His Spirit on the Cassie Hills in Nagaland of India. Praise the Lord. And around the world, every revival read, it's the same thing when the people repented. Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And shall come to pass, last day saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Why so many don't have the spirit of God? Why so many don't have this promise of God that God's promised for us in these last days, even amongst professing Christians? Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter preaches. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, through remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Do you know there's some denominations that preach you don't need to repent? There are denominations, churches, Christians today who preach you don't need to repent. There are some false teachers, heretics, who are going to go to hell if they don't repent, who teach that repentance is a work. And if you believe in repentance, I say you believe in work salvation. I've met heretics like that. I've met hypocrites like that. I've been kicked out of churches that believe like that, that you don't need to repent. What do they all have in common? All those churches say you don't need to repent. All those churches and Christians say repentance is a work. What do they have in common? None of them have the gifts of the Holy Ghost. You talk about tongues then, they don't even know what it is. It's languages. It's, if they're speaking languages here and, and they learn language, they get all confused, though the Bible calls it unknown tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. There are some people who preach you don't need to repent. Then it comes to tongues and say it's a language. But in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2 it is written, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. When the Bible talks about speaking in tongues, it's talking about speaking in unknown tongues that no man understands except they get interpretation by the Holy Ghost. But yet there are professing Christians that think tongues are languages. These same ones that preach you don't need to repent. These same ones that preach that repentance as a work are the same ones that also say that tongues are a language when 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 2 says, No man understandeth him, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. You see, when people don't believe in repentance, even amongst Christians, when people say repentance is a work and you don't need to do a work, even amongst Christians, they all have this in common. They don't have the Holy Ghost. They may have a bunch of head knowledge, they may read a bunch of books, but they got no power. They've got no Holy Ghost. They're not witnesses unto Christ because they lack the Spirit of God. Though it is written in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, as the Apostle Peter preaches, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Isn't it a shame there's professing Christians in church buildings today 
that have not the Spirit of God. When God has given to us this promise in these last days we're living in, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that have poured a spirit upon all flesh, there are Christians that don't have the Spirit of God. There are churches that don't have the Spirit of God. There are whole denominations that don't have the Spirit of God. And what do they all have in common? They don't believe in repentance. For Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, in this sermon, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. No repentance, no Holy Ghost. For our God's Spirit is holy. And if a professing Christian continues on in sin and does not repent, does not turn from that sin, does not pray to God and confess his sins, he will not have the Holy Ghost. God's Spirit cannot dwell in an unclean vessel. God will not empower an unclean vessel. God will not give His Spirit, His Holy Spirit, unto those that are unclean. And there's one way to be clean, it's by the Word of God, and you hear what God's Word says, and if you're living contrary, you repent. And what does repent mean? Stop doing it. Break with it. Turn the other way. Get away from it. Run away from it as far as you can. Whatever sin it may be. Somebody said, well, just a little sin. It's just a little habit. God understands. No, God does not understand sin because God is holy. No, God knows I'm just going through a hard time. It just makes me happy. No, no. God doesn't know God is holy. He doesn't know about sin. That's the devil. If you think your God understands your sin, if you think God knows about your sin, He understands why you're doing it, your God is the devil because God of the Bible is holy. And God doesn't understand sin. God doesn't know sin because God is holy. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, told them, Go and sin no more. Now the Lord didn't condone sin. When he saved that woman caught in adultery, caught in the very act, they brought her before Christ. They said, Moses said, The sort of what sayest thou? He stooped down and began to write with his finger on the ground. And then looked up at them and said, He that is well sin cast the first stone. And they all backed off one by one. He went to the one and says, Where are thine accusers? There's no man accusing. No man, Lord. And the Lord says, Neither I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself, this is after he stooped down around the ground with his finger, and saw none but the woman, after he told them he saw a sin cast the first stone, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? If no man condemn thee, verse 11, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, because I understand your sin. I understand you're just weak, you're just struggling. I understand you're not perfect. No. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. He doesn't understand sin. He doesn't say, it's okay, you can sin. I understand. No, no, it's grace. I, I'll, I'll look the other way. He doesn't do that. He says, go and sin no more, for the Lord is holy. The triune God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, are holy. And if you desire to be filled with God's Spirit, as God has promised the last days for to spread upon all flesh and continue in sin, if you do not repent, you will not have God's Spirit. If you continue in sin, He will hold His Spirit from you, and the answer to receive this promise of God, as He has promised for His Spirit upon all flesh, is repent. No repentance, no Spirit of God. And those churches... I do not believe in repenting. Those churches say repenting is a work. Those churches do not preach repentance. They don't have the Holy Ghost. You talk about the gifts of the Spirit, they have no idea what you're talking about. They're confused. They don't even know what it is. Because they have no experience of the Holy Ghost. They don't have the Holy Ghost because God has not given them His Spirit. Though He's promised for a Spirit of all flesh because they refuse to repent. God has poured a Spirit upon all flesh in these last days. 
there's only one way to receive it, to repent. And when we repent, we get right with the Lord and seek the Lord, turn Him from our sins, turn Him from our wicked ways, turn Him from our evil ways. He gives us this gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. He endues us with power from on high that we can be witnesses unto Christ, both in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the earth. Praise the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy word it should doeth forever, as Thou hast magnified the word above all of Thy name. Pray that us even sanctifies for Thy truth, for Thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.